Okay, the next talk is by Nathan Jensen, Don't Follow the Crowd, Incentives for Directed Spatial Sampling. Hi, thank you for this opportunity. Um, this is work that I did with colleagues from here at Cornell University, University of Sydney, and the International Livestock Research Institute. This is on a crowdsourcing effort we did in northern Kenya. So a bunch of uh, people have already mentioned, Carlo and Stefano, that Africa is poorly sensed. I won't go into that. But what people in my profession usually do when uh, we don't have a lot of data is we go in there ourselves and we collect it ourselves or we hire people to do it. So that's extremely costly and it takes a long time. What we were hoping is that as these mobile phones um, service expands, we can use mobile phones and put them in the hands of pastoralists and ask them to start collecting data for us in these remote locations. If you look at the map on the right hand side, you can see there's cell phone coverage in Africa. This is about five years old. But the important thing to notice here is that there's not only cell phone coverage in the capital city, so these are you know, the orange dots that you see, but there's also dots out here in sort of the, the hinterlands. So these are areas that are hard to reach, and these are areas where a lot of our work takes place. We were hoping that we could take advantage of these cell phone networks to collect data. It would allow us to tap into local knowledge of their environment. We could ask people to ask, respond to questions about their livelihoods, about the conditions around them. And it would also be quite quick, right? And it could be very cost effective. Of course, with crowdsourcing, as uh, we've mentioned already, there's some issues with sampling. Michigan has talked about um, the idea that uh, submissions would likely be clustered, and that's what I'll be talking about today. There's also quality-related issues that we just heard about as well, and then Eddie will give us, a post, give us a talk about later as well. So the setting, northern Kenya. Um, the population there are pastoralists, and they depend on livestock for the majority of their income. These, the, the livestock strategy is to bring them out into the rangelands, and they essentially track after forage. They don't do cut and carry, they're not visiting forage markets. So this means that the available forage in the open rangeland is really what determines how much their income is. During drought conditions, the forage disappears and we end up with these large humanitarian crises that we've seen in 2011 and sort of every five or ten years before them. Because of that, humanitarian agencies have begun to track forage conditions using uh, remotely sensed data. This works quite well. You can see this map on the left hand side. This is Kenya. And this is NDVI data, so it's showing the greenness of, of the vegetation in there. And it's differenced, so it's uh, using historic data and it's subtracting out the mean. So areas that are green on this map are greener than normal for that season, and areas that are brown are brown, uh, drier than normal for that season. This works quite well to identify when droughts are taking place, but what it misses is that not all vegetation is useful for pastoralists. So some vegetation is palatable and some is not. If you look at these pictures on the right hand side, you can see these are pictures of the rangelands and the areas that we work in. And if you're herding cattle, for example, cattle can only eat grass. So this top right hand picture, the greenness means something very good for you. But as you move down, you see, okay, there's a bunch of shrubs that are green, they're showing up in NDVI. But of course, they, they don't hold any value for the pastoralist. Our idea then is to take existing remotely sensed data and then integrate local, local information from pastoralists to create a forage model. This model, of course, will have some sort of uncertainty associated with it and will evolve over time. So then we'll iterate and we'll ask pastoralists to go to new places. We'll identify areas where our uncertainty is highest and we can ask them to go collect more data from us there. So you can think about this as sort of just a simple classification process, but we're gonna be doing this over time too, right? Because different vegetation will evolve over time and under different conditions at different speed. So just a simple classification isn't sufficient. Implementation. So once again, we're in northern Kenya. You can see Kenya's outline there. Our study region was about 100 by 100 uh, kilometers square, which is in the gray there. We had 113 uh, volunteer pastoralists. We provided them with smartphones, internet bundles, solar chargers, etc. We trained them on this very simple vegetation survey. The survey, uh, first of all, didn't assume literacy. Uh, it was written mostly using icons, so it's very simple. We're just asking people to identify which types of plants are around them, how abundant they are, how green they are, and then which types of animals could eat those. You can see we're thinking, okay, we have NDVI value. This tells you about the greenness. Now we're just going to try to parse out what does this greenness mean as far as value for the pastoralist. Uh, we also asked them to take a photo. So each survey has a photo accompanied it that we can use to validate the survey if we want to. And that's other work that uh, Eddie will talk a little bit about. We paid them about 20 cents per submission, and we had some protocols. People could submit a maximum of 
I think 10 a day and it had to be during the daylight. And by the end of about five months during the main implementation, we had over 112,000 submissions from these 110 or 113 volunteers. So that part of the uh, program was quite successful. So thinking about clustering, about uh, the spatial distribution of submissions, in the first phase of the project, we trained everybody on the survey and then we sent them out. So not all of these um, volunteers had ever used a smartphone or a phone, for example. So we had to train them on and we sent them out. We just wanted to see, make sure that the survey worked, that our processes worked. And you can see what the response was after about 20 days. The bottom left-hand side is our baseline data. So we paid people a flat fee. You could submit surveys anywhere you want to. You get about 20 cents. We have about 25,000 submissions in that picture. It doesn't look like it because most of them are just on top of each other, right? We have a clustering problem. We expected this. And so what we had done is we had divided up the survey region into 96 subregions. And then we could put rewards, different rewards on these subregions. So we could have spatially varying rewards, very similar to um, what Yixing just talked to us about. And then to communicate this, we put an app, Rich developed an app for us, actually, um, that was on their smartphone. They could open up, it would show their location, the rewards at their location, the rewards around them. And importantly, we could update this. So we could dynamically update this remotely. So uh, Yixing had wrote some algorithms. So we could think about how to best move people away from the center to de best decluster them. That's pretty much, um, you can see this is just going to be kind of a tease. So if you guys want to come talk about this more, I have a poster out there, and Eddie has a poster. But uh, the, broad, the project findings themselves, uh, it was quite successful. We got a great deal of data. We're still working on generating forage map. But as a proof of concept, it worked very well in a region where cell phone service was spotty in a population of people that we're not very you know, tech savvy at that point. The dynamic rewards worked very well. It increased submissions in undersampled areas and reduced submissions in oversampled areas. So that was another issue, right? So if you think about sort of the value of information to the cost of information, this, this ratio went up quite considerably. There's additional project information. We have a website. Uh, I mentioned these other posters already. And I think Chris Barrett will be talking about some of this stuff tomorrow as well. Thank you. Okay, we have time for a question. Yeah. I guess I was just wondering about the choice of the human as the kind of cell phone player in this situation. Because if you're having to provide them cell phones and training mm -hmm. and all of this stuff, it almost seems like it would be easier to try to use something like a drone. Yeah. You know, for only fifty dollars, you have no sampling bias. You can just cover the area. Why phones in a place where there are phones already? Yeah, so and that's interesting, and we definitely discussed drones. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a couple reasons. So this is as a proof of concept, and I'll have to say that, you know, what, as you've seen here already, there, there's other groups talking about using crowdsourcing and stuff like that. So this is all sort of this technology used in these remote or more remote locations is something very new, drones included. Um, so as a proof of concept, we're interested in in a couple things. And one, you know, vegetation conditions itself, maybe a drone would be the better option. Because now that we have processes for identifying images, maybe the drone can do the classification for us. But for other things, it, people are a little bit better. Right? And so we want to use, in some cases, you might want to ask a pastoralist uh, to use their expert knowledge, for example, about which species is palatable and which isn't over time. And so a drone, you could pay a bunch of, you could pay enough money that you might be able to identify the species of the plant. I don't really know. No, we really. have a drone project in the same region, actually, uh -huh. almost overlapping area. It's, uh, you, you still need people on the ground, and other than that, we, I think, have the last legal drone in Africa, in Kenya. <laughs> the drones are yeah. not legal anymore in Kenya. So in Kenya, they're not legal, right? Yeah. In other locations, so. Yeah. Yeah. so I think I think that's the answer. I, we're just trying to, as a group of concept, too, we're, we're in a situation right now where we're just paying way too much money for this type of information. You might think about asking a pastor to respond about their own economic conditions and those sorts of things. So other projects I'm working on do that, which which it's not. All right, let's thank our speaker.